So I think we're, if we're all live, I want to welcome you here and uh, say hello to everyone and welcome you to what we hope will be the first of many live stream events of the Basin Arrange Dark Sky Cooperative. My name is Don Nielsen and I'm the Dark Sky Preservation Director of Rose City Astronomers in Oregon and I'm also a delegate with the International Dark Sky Association. You know, in these topsy-turvy times we're in, it's, it's great to have this opportunity to gather together under a night sky and remind ourselves that we're all one under this sky. And it's an opportunity for us to remember that, you know, we're connected throughout the universe with everything else that's living on this earth because we too are all made of stardust. So, you know, it's, it's hard to get that opportunity to think and reflect like that because with light pollution, we rarely even bother to look up at, our, at the night sky anymore. But if you can get to a dark sky, and that's what we're here to protect, you will see just an amazing, amazing sight. And so we're going to do our best job to present that to you tonight. But first, if you give me a moment to... share the team because we are we are ready to um, give you a great show. I'd like to thank members of the cooperative that have contributed to tonight's event. Thanks go to Ashley Pipkin of the National Park Service, Kirk Peterson of Friends of the Nevada Wilderness, Rick Rolf of the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network, Aviva O'Neill of the Great Basin Observatory at Great Basin National Park. Our star party MC, Jim Todd, who is the director of Kendall Planetarium at the, Nash at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, which we in Oregon lovingly call OMSI. And our many telescope operators. In Nevada, we have Keith C uh, Caceres, who is the president of the Las Vegas Astronomical Society, and their event coordinator, David Blanchett. The Las Vegas uh, Astronomical Society is also our Zoom host, so a big shout out and thanks for that. In Oregon, representing RCA, we have special guest astronomer and book author Richard Berry, who is the former editor of Astronomy Magazine and longtime contributor to both Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazines. We also have Mark Lowenthal and Jeff Lee, both amateur astronomers extraordinaire. So this is our agenda for tonight. We'd like to spend the first half hour with you while it's getting dark, providing you with some education on stargazing and on the pristine dark skies of the Basin and Range province. The remainder of our time together, we'll be witnessing live images of a variety of celestial objects, including open and globular star clusters, galaxies, binary stars, a nebula composed of a remnant supernova, nebulae of star-making factories, and of course, our moon and a few planets in our solar system. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. If your audio and video are on, please turn them off while others are speaking so we maintain maximum bandwidth. Also, volumes will be kind of varied, so you're responsible to, to uh, control your own volume on your end. If you lose connection over Zoom, please check into the Basin Arranged Dark Sky Cooperative Facebook page to find the event live streaming. On Zoom, you can ask questions in the Q&A tab. On Facebook, you can place a comment. And after we observe all the scheduled objects, we'll try to address some of those questions as we also find some bonus objects for you to see. We plan to exit completely the Zoom meeting by 10 p.m. And now, Without further delay, I'd like to introduce you to Ashley Pipkin, the director of the cooperative, whose job with the National Park Service takes her to some of the most pristine skies in the United States. Ashley? Okay, so thanks everyone for joining tonight. Like Don said, my name is Ashley Pipkin, and I work for the Night Skies Division of the National Park Service. I have the great pleasure to coordinate the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. I'm happy to introduce the expanded cooperative in our first ever virtual basin and range uh, dark sky cooperative star party tonight. So uh, first I want to spend a little time discussing why the basin and range is so special. 
Well, let's just start with the understanding that for thousands of years, humans and wildlife spent half of their life in daylight and half in natural darkness. Fully being able to appreciate the beauty and the differences of what both could offer. But after the invention of the light bulb, just over a hundred years ago, we have transformed our nocturnal landscape. For the past five and a half years, I have worked with the Night Skies Division of the National Park Service, collecting information about the quality of the night sky throughout the Western United States. I take a camera like the one you see in the bottom left hand corner out to mountaintops and detect what light is out there a few hours after the sun has set. I have stood under many types of skies. I have stood under the sky near my home, close to the Las Vegas Strip, unable to see a star in the sky. I have seen wildlife confused and caught like a net in bright lights, unable to navigate by the stars that they have evolved to use as beacons for migration. I have also had some amazing opportunities to go out to places that are so dark that a blanket of stars covers the whole sky until it meets the ground. Where the stillness of night comes alive and your shadow is revealed under the brightest moon and stars you could imagine. This experience of seeing a pristine natural night sky was once incredibly common. Now more than 80% of Americans cannot even see the Milky Way from their own backyards. And once you get to experience natural night skies, like the ones we share in the cooperative, you really start to understand how wasteful artificial light robs us of such an important part of our planet. So this is a map of artificial light pollution in the United States. And this is the camera that I get to take out. And so you can see in places close to Las Vegas, um, there's a lot of light pollution. So we're going from the brightest skies in red to the darkest skies in black. And in between two cities, in between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, you see this bright um, but fading uh, source of light on the horizon. But incredibly, in incredibly dark places like Great Basin National Park, you can see the Milky Way covering the night sky from horizon to horizon. So here you can see my little car in the picture. So this is taking a picture of the ground and these are the satellite images that you see. After seeing those images, I hope that we all understand that we have a responsibility to protect the night sky. Reducing light pollution and then reaping the benefits and astounding beauty and stunning view of the cosmos. With light pollution or the excessive waste of artificial light, we have removed the natural cues that wildlife, especially our nocturnal wildlife, rely on to properly function in their habitat. In many places, we have taken the stars right out of the sky. Well, tonight, we are going to have an opportunity to view some of those amazing objects as we take a whirlwind tour throughout the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. We are going to visit areas from Nevada and Oregon and visit some of the darkest skies in the lower 48 along the way. We are going to see planets in our solar system, star formations, beautiful nebulas and galaxies. Some of these objects are more than 20 million light years away, yet under our natural night skies and with the aid of telescopes, we are able to share this faint sparkle in the sky with each other tonight. We're going to take this opportunity to be reminded why we love the night so much. Hopefully by the end of the night, you will all feel a bit more connected with each other and ready to do what you can to protect the night sky, reduce light pollution, and put the stars back in the night sky throughout the basin and range and in your own backyards. So while I currently coordinate the cooperative, we all work together to build the cooperative. And we could not do that without each other and without your support. We are composed of a wonderful group of federal, state, and nonprofit partners. We have astronomy clubs, universities, and observatories all working together to celebrate and interpret the night sky in this multi-state effort. Our best hope for protecting access to our beautiful night skies is to work together. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. If you get some time and want to learn more, we would love to have you like us on Facebook and Instagram. We'll be posting videos on the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative YouTube, and please visit us at brdarkskies.org. I'm so thankful for all the participants in tonight's program, 
and then I'm going to pass the microphone off. All right, bravo. Okay, so now we're going to kind of move around the, the basin and range. So we're going to start at the southernmost end of where we have participation, and that's at the Great Basin National Park, um, where Aviva O'Neill, who um, is part of the, 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 the Friends of the Park, has put together a short video for us. Hi, I'm Aviva O'Neill, Program Manager at Great Basin and National Park Foundation. Dark skies are really an important and wonderful resource at Great Basin National Park. The park and the foundation together are doing a bunch of programs to preserve, interpret, and explore the dark skies above the park. Something special about this park is that the park and the foundation work together to create the first research-grade astronomical observatory that's ever built in the National Park. In 2015, we constructed the Great Basin Observatory, a project dreamed up by a Great Basin Park Ranger. The GBO is the first research-grade observatory ever built in the United States National Park. Set at an elevation of almost 7,000 feet with no significant man-made light for 70 miles in all directions, the observatory is a state-of-the-art, remotely operated, optical, astronomical telescope, which allows researchers to explore astronomy and science from the park's pristine dark skies. Four university partners work with us in the Great Basin Observatory project. This allows students in places that have lots of light pollution to access the amazing dark skies above the park for research and education. So projects that students are working on are looking at exoplanet transits, understanding double star systems, looking into how when stars are circling a black hole, what kind of information we can get from that. Um, those are called cataclysmic variables. And just the, the aspect of learning to do research using a very high-grade telescope is um, unusual and very special for the students that are using the Great Basin Observatory. Researchers also will do astrophotography. And so we have a bunch of beautiful images that come out that let us share the excitement of the beauty of the cosmos. Great Basin National Park Foundation also partners with the park to deliver youth education. The building of the Great Basin Observatory inspired us to create science education curricular resources for teachers which are made available on the Great Basin Observatory web portal. We work in Great Basin area schools, connecting children to the park through classroom presentations, field trips, and material resources and trainings for teachers. Our goal is to encourage students to engage in science and conservation more deeply through place-based learning and to treasure the Great Basin region in which they live. As you can see by this virtual background behind me, Great Basin National Park is a beautiful place with uh, tall mountain peaks, beautiful lakes, lots of great hiking, excellent camping, the oldest trees, um, the bristlecone pine trees, and these views of these amazing dark sky, dark night skies. So we do hope that um, when times are better and we're not in a pandemic that you will all come out and visit and enjoy the dark skies from Great Basin National Park. And until then, um, we hope that you'll visit the Great Basin Observatory website um, learn more learn more about the research that we're doing right now and um, take a look at some more beautiful pictures. The other thing I'd like to invite you to is right now our telescope is not capable of doing live viewing, but we are working on that. Um, the Great Basin National Park Astronomy Festival will be happening later in September. So we invite you to check that out. Um, and hopefully by then we will have live viewing from the Great Basin Observatory. So from all of us at the Great Basin Observatory, we're glad that you are here tonight at the Star Party, and we are excited partner of the Basin Range Dark Sky Cooperative. 
After all, half the park is after dark. So now I'd like to take you to uh, an introduction to some stargazing. Hi, I'm Don Nielsen and I'm with Rose City Astronomers. And I'm here today to talk to you about this great tool for stargazing called a planisphere. And it's a really simple tool to use once you get a little bit of instructions. And so let me just show you some of the parts around the sphere. So around the outside wheel, we have the months of the year, and then within each month, tick marks are the dates. And then on the inside ring, we have a 24 hour clock. So it's pretty simple. You just wanna line up the date and time of when you wanna stargaze. So even if it's two weeks out or if it's immediately. So here we'll start and look at the sky right now. You can see the Milky Way here in the sky right in uh, the way it's set up right now is right on the horizon. But I'm going to go and look for September. And here we are, September. And we're at September 5th. And we're at 8 p.m. And when I move that to 8 p.m., ah, you see, the Milky Way has changed. And now the Milky Way is a band right over our heads. Now, sadly, 80% or more of us don't see the Milky Way from our homes anymore. And that's because of light pollution. But it's there. And if you can get to some dark skies, you'll see this great, wonderful Milky Way above your head. So when you're looking at a planisphere, what's inside this, this zone right here is what's in the sky. What's in this yellow area here is what's below the horizon. So just like the planets, the sun, the moon, and the planets, the constellations rise in the east and they set in the west. So if you watched when I turn this, if I go later in the night, things that are here start to disappear and constellations over here start to up here. So when you're looking at here, you're looking at everything on the horizon. When you're looking right in the middle of this area, you're looking directly overhead. So you're not looking in the center of the wheel as what's directly above your head. You're looking at the center of this egg portion right here. Another cool thing on this is this band right here, and this is called the ecliptic, and this is the path that the sun, the moon, and the planets move through, the, the imaginary plane, so to speak. Now, when you go to use this, you wanna find your direction, you wanna face north or south, and so here's face, face north, and if I face south, I'm going to put this right over my head, and I'm going to face south, and everything over here is to my west and everything here is to the east and, and I'm totally lined up with what's above my head. And then once I acquaint myself to that juxtaposition, then I can bring it down and just kind of do a little, a little scramble inversion. Um, another thing that I want to show you is on the back, there's lots of information here. So there's information on meteor showers, on great telescope and binocular objects, a little bit of mythology and where you might find the planets. Now these things come in different sizes. They come in large, medium, and there's a small. But I definitely recommend that you do not buy the small because it's just too small to see the constellations. This is a great size if you can um, find one this size. So, you know, you don't need much to stargaze. Grab a chair or a blanket and a planisphere along with a red flashlight, maybe a pair of binoculars, and you're set to go. So. Have a great time out there. Good night, dark skies. Okay, so those things run, that big one there is about uh, 20, $22. The medium one that I showed is about, about uh, 10 to $12 that you can, you can buy. So now I'm gonna take you to a really special place for us Oregonians. And that is to the Oregon Outback, which like its name is like the Australian Outback. It's significantly remote. I would uh, be safe to say that the overwhelming majority of Oregonians have never even been to this area. It's usually, it's about three counties, um, Harney, Lake, and Malheur counties. And this is a video that was done by Rick Rolfe um, who is in Lake County. We're very fortunate to live in an area that the dark skies are normal that most people can't even conceive of. The high desert of North America, 
nearly half a million square kilometers of semi-arid land. This massive geological and environmental Great Basin region is home to countless natural wonders and resources. One of them is darkness. Nestled on the western edge of this enormous expanse of mountains and valleys is a remote area among the darkest places on the continent. When we were in Lake County with Travel Oregon doing a rural tourism studio, it was really clear there was a lot of energy in the room across the county um, recognizing the uniqueness of the dark sky. Measurements confirm these are world-class skies. It is winter solstice, December 21st, 2019, and we're going to take a meter reading, sky quality meter. Go see how dark it is. We got 2178. Class one skies are characterized as black. Richard Berry, astrophotographer and former editor of Astronomy Magazine, describes the darkness in Eastern Oregon as an incredible resource. This is, this or this was where we were last night. Okay, excellent dark sky site. And here's, here's a map that X marks the spot. Rural Oregon has an incredible resource out here. We need to be able to protect the dark skies. There's a problem with encroachment, with uh, people putting in more and more lights. Yes, we have to grow, we have to have the lights, but if we can do it right, we can still preserve our dark sky. With the formation of the Oregon Outback Dark Sky Network, specialists are working with the local population to determine how a dark sky designation might apply to areas in Oregon. A reserve is a very large contiguous area of dark sky. And I'm wanting to get the Fremont a designation with the International Dark Sky Association. As the world continues to lose its dark places, humanity becomes more alienated from the source of information. Did our ancient ancestors ever conceive that one day we would have to save the stars? Run into you in the dark. Okay, I just wanted to add that the, um, the first video we saw from the Great Basin is an international dark sky park. Uh, the next one that we will see is of an area that is the, um, it is also a international dark sky, it's a dark sky sanctuary. And the folks in the Oregon Outback, and I've been quite involved with that for the past uh, year, are also looking to nominate uh, a very large contiguous site, given the, the amount of dark skies there, as an international dark sky place. And if you've never been in super dark skies, it's the difference between a grayish sky with the contrast of white and inky black. And people who've never seen that absolute, that number one sky, it, um, it's just incomparable. So seeing the Milky Way is one thing, but seeing all the exceptional details of it and the contrast of the sky is another. So Kirk Peterson is, um, is, uh, in, works for the Friends of the Nevada Wilderness and uh, over, I guess it's been about a little over a year that the that the northern area, it's of, of uh, Nevada, right on the Oregon border. It's a, it's part of the Bureau of Land Management and it's a wilderness study area. And that whole entire wilderness study area of Massacre Rim was designated an international dark sky sanctuary, super remote. And it's just right over the border. So looking at the outback and the part of Nevada, it would be continuing to protect that really big chunk of blackness that uh, Ashley showed on her graphs. So this is a video that uh, PBS uh, went out to the Massacre Rim. So all the scenes here in the sky here are at Massacre Rim. By shifting to red, we're shifting away from that daylight color of light. And it allows those 
our eyes to start slowly adjusting. There's another aspect of darkness too, and that is, you know, we are creatures of this earth. And for most of our existence as humans, for the last 50,000 years, we have lived in these patterns of daylight and darkness. Our bodies need that. And with all the artificial lights we bring into our life, we're not getting that. They find out when people get out into the wilderness, one of the best remedies they get is having dark nights. And when that happens, your body's circadian rhythm starts kicking in, you're resting better at night, and you just feel better. So if you're gonna go out and have a dark sky experience, or go out and explore dark skies, what, what are the, some of the things we can do? Well, one of the amazing things today is the cameras that we have. Even our cell phones have really good cameras. And they can take dark sky pictures because what's gonna happen is our eyes adjust to the, the darkness and open up. You're gonna see incredible things out there. You can capture that with your camera. Dark sky photography allows you to take a little longer exposures and it'll capture even more than you see. What did you bring tonight to capture that? Well, I've got my DSLR camera. So the first, first thing I did is I rolled up the ISO to about 3200. Then I've got the uh, aperture at F2.8, which is just wide open. And then I've got 15 seconds up here for the exposure. And then you just let it go. And 15 seconds later, it'll flash up with the image on the screen. This is how Kirk's time-lapse recording turned out. Kirk and the Friends of Nevada Wilderness shared some of the photos and video they've taken of night skies over the years. And you can see that even though everyone is looking at the same sky, the result of their photography is anything but redundant. I brought a small telescope so we can zoom in. We have Jupiters up there, very clear, Saturn's on the side, a little bit of Scorpio. And with a telescope, we should be able to see some of the banding on Jupiter and possibly wow. the rings on Saturn. And it's a very small telescope. You don't need much. Binoculars, if you've got a good pair of binoculars, you can just lay back and just prowl the skies. Oh, that's cool. And the, those binoculars will 10 times as many stars as you can see with the naked eye. I can't wait to see the, light, the sky light up. This is gonna be great. So, so we guess, probably should turn off the bright lights that are in say, our faces and check it out. I guess if we want to see things light up, we actually have to shut down, right? Yeah, we do, unfortunately. All right. All right. right. Give your eyes that time to adjust and we'll see what we can see. Cool. All right, cool. That's a Jupiter up there. It's not real sharp, but you can definitely see the ball and see the three moons okay. off to either side. Oh, wow. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's just a really small telescope. That is really neat. You know, part of the experience too is I can hear the coyotes starting to sing mm -hmm. out there. It's just a cool way to enjoy the night. Okay. All right, well, did you hear the part where she said, I can hear the coyotes at night? And that's such a big part of going out to a dark sky. It's not just the stars, it's the amazing quiet. And you'll find when people are under the stars, everybody gets quieter. People whisper to one another because there's just this, um, there's just some kind of secretness to it, so to speak. But, um, so speaking of sacred and going to the stars, our next, our next guest is Jim Todd, who has been with Argon's beloved OMSI, our science museum, for over 30 years, directing the Kendall Planetarium. And he's, if you want to learn more, get online and go to OMSI. There's tons and tons of videos there that Jim's been responsible for and learn more about astronomy and dark skies. Well, thank you, Don, and um, I'm Jim Todd. I'm the Director of Space Science Education at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. I'm also the liaison with the Rose City Astronomers Club, which is it's a phenomenal club here in Portland, Oregon, and they have their meetings here, um, which, uh, here but at the museum um, once a month, and they have a wonderful membership of around, around 600 or more, and so, um, they are truly amazing. And so we all share a commonality of enjoyment 
in uh, passion for the nighttime sky. And what I'd like to do now is show you kind of a, an overview of where we're going to be looking uh, tonight. And we got these amazing telescopes set up uh, for viewing. And uh, what I'm going to do is kind of highlight some of the areas that we're going to be viewing. And this is just a program that I like to use online. It's called Solarium Web. And there are a variety of software they can use, PlanetSAM software they can use uh, for um, learning about the nighttime sky. There's Solarium, Star Night Pro, uh, Sky Safari. Those are just a few. Uh, but I like this one because it works well on Zoom. And this is what I use for a classroom. It's a cl great resource for teachers. There's also um, a site that you can go to, to skymap.com uh, that you can download a free map monthly. Uh, to get uh, the latest uh, images, uh, as far as not images, but uh, a list of things that you can look at. Um, and it's a very uh, useful resource. It's also free. You can get it for the Northern Hemisphere, the Equator, and the Southern Hemisphere. So if you're planning a trip, you can download it and you can uh, put it in your own backpack. So what I want to do is kind of start off uh, looking at the nighttime sky and uh, for tonight and uh, we have a very interesting lineup of objects that we're going to be seeing so the first step you should always do that uh, when you want to learn about the nighttime sky is to get your compass bearing so you want to face north and if you don't know where north is one of the things that you look for is where the sun is set it's always set in the west but also try to remember some of the familiar landmarks that you associate with uh, looking north so after sunset, you face, face toward the north. The first step you should find anytime you want to learn the nighttime sky is to find the Big Dipper. Okay, and the Big Dipper now in September before midnight is low above the northern horizon. Okay, this is actually an asterism. Okay, and then you have the seven stars that outline the spoon in the sky. And it's part of the constellation called Ursa Major, which is seen as the Great Bear in the sky. So once you find those two, uh, the Big Dipper, we're going to use it as the guidepost to help you find other stars and constellations throughout the evening. You take these two end stars at the bowl of the Big Dipper, draw an imaginary line until you come to the first bright star. And that star is called Polaris. This is all pole star. And this is a star that sits above the Earth's North Pole. And this is uh, to also will show you your latitude location. And so you have good information right over here. It's about 432 light years away, uh, the magnitude of two. So that means that it would be visible from, um, from the city uh, for the most part. Um, our eyes have the limit of being able to see object as six. And so that's another thing about dark skies is that uh, when you look at, talk about magnitude, Magnitude is everything about how you can see things in the nighttime sky. So, uh, Polaris is in the constellation known as Ursa Minor, which is also referred to as the Little Dipper. Okay? And one of the things that astronomers do often is they'll look at these, this star and these two end stars, okay? and those are your key and help you determine whether or not the viewing is good. Uh, if the viewing is good, you should be able to see these stars in between. And if you can see those stars, then you have pretty decent viewing. Uh, but if you have a full moon and a bright moon or a city light, uh, those are difficult to see, actually. Okay, and then opposite to the Big Dipper, um, hey, we've got a nice meteor shot, um, is we have this letter W, and this is Cassiopeia. This is the queen. And so if you want to locate uh, the, the area of the, of the Milky Way, find Cassiopeia, and this is what will help you as a guide to find the plane of the Milky Way. And so once you orient yourself toward the north, okay, um, and uh, so you're facing in that direction, then behind you will be uh, south, and then um, what you're facing north to your right will be east, and then to your left will be west. Okay? So you have your comfort bearing all set up for you. Okay? And then uh, we're going to swing around. Okay? And just swing around. And now we're looking at the southern part of the sky. Now keep in mind the Earth is tilted, by the way, at 23 and a half degrees. 
Okay, so that means this region of the sky is called the circumpolar region. And these are the stars and constellations that remain above the horizon as the Earth turns counterclockwise. I can do a real quick model of that for you. Get this out of the way. And then, uh, and get this video all the way. There we go. And there, there's the clock. And then you can kind of move it around, see how it shifts back and forth. Okay, so that's the circumpolar region. Okay, and then we go over to the south. And then in the south, these are the seasonal stars. And as the Earth goes around the sun, we get uh, the recognizable uh, constellation related to the zodiac. Uh, and so on. So these are the stars that we see seasonally. Okay? And so we'll be, be looking at this quite a bit uh, during the evening. And so some of the highlights that we have for tonight, uh, let's start off overhead. And there's the Big Dipper. Okay? And then we're going to be looking at the what's called uh, the Summer Triangles right over here. Okay? And then we have Sagittarius, the Scorpion. We have Pegasus, Andromeda. So as, the, as we go into the evening, we're going to be looking at what we call deep sky objects. And so if we zoom in, especially in this program, okay, and if you have sky maps or an app that can be a useful guide to help you find your way around. There's Jupiter and Saturn. They're going to put on a great show tonight. And then as you get closer, you start seeing these Messier objects. Okay? And these are... Uh, a list of objects, 110 bright objects that could be seen from your own backyard. And so uh, we're going to start off with the first group is actually going to be in the area of Sagittarius. Okay? This is seen uh, as what we call a centaur. Right? And so this is a half man, half goat. And some people will refer to this as the teapot. Okay? And the teapot is a very useful reference I'm looking for Sagittarius, right? and the dirt to teapot, and then in this area alone, there's roughly about 14 Messier objects, 14. And that's because we're looking toward the center of the Milky Way in this region. Now, of course, we can't see it with a visible light, but in other waveform like extra gamma rays and so on, we see and clearly it's an indication that the uh, center of the Milky Way is located about roughly 29, uh, 30,000 uh, light years away. Okay? And then we have all these labels, the Messier objects. And what we're going to do tonight, we're going to skip from one to another, and I'm going to give you a little highlight of each of them. But we have this amazing crew of uh, telescope operators. They're going to be able to show you some of these wonderful objects that we're going to be looking at uh, for viewing uh, tonight. And so um, the first one, I want to turn this over to Richard Berry, my friend Richard Berry here. And um, we're going to uh, take first take a look at M1. So Richard, are you there? Usual. Remember to unmute your mic. I'll share my screen. Okay, yeah, I got to close that. And right. yeah. Okay, we should be looking at the control system for my telescope. Um, and I just want to verify, is that actually it? Jim or somebody? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, and right now, the it's just gotten dark. It was bright before so that the screen was all, all blue. Um, and the camera on the telescope right now is taking a picture every two seconds. Um, I can adjust somewhat the brightness of, this, of the image, but um, this is about the way this object called the Lagoon Nebula would look through a fairly big telescope. You can see a wonderful little star cluster here where stars are being, have been made, and a, another region of gas and dust where um, stars are in the process of being made. Now, if I stop taking short exposures and begin to take long exposures. We've gone from two second exposures to 10 second exposures. And each time it takes a picture, it's going to um, add the light from the previous exposure. So our pictures will get better and better as time goes on. 
Um, and so we're actually looking at kind of like a bright emission nebula that which you're trying to capture that uh, that hydrogen cloud. That's right. You can see this entire region of space is lit up by the fluorescing hydrogen gas, which mm. when it's in a gas tube on Earth or when it's in outer space and lit by stars, it glows red. It's amazing to look at that. Uh, it's about roughly a diameter of 110 to 50 light years. So that's pretty impressive. That's a pretty big area. It's, it's um, a large and complicated area that um, is full of all sorts of uh, gas and dust um, small molecules. Um, this is where stars form and uh, telescopes in orbit can actually see the stars that are forming in here uh, whose light as they form is, is blocked by the dust and stuff like that. This is what we see when we look at it with a telescope. Richard and people always ask why is it called Lagoon? Um, I think it's called Lagoon because of this dark region where this, the, the, um, the sea, if you will, um, comes in, and this is the surrounding uh, terrain. Mm -hmm. And it's about a distance of uh, roughly about 4,000 light years away. So 100 light years wide, 4,000 light years away. That's a pretty amazing shot. It's right on the fringe of sixth uh, magnitude, right, Richard? Yes. Um, you can, in a dark sky, you can see this by eye. In binoculars, you can see the star cluster and just a delicate little wisp of this nebulosity. Um, those of us who grew up in the 1960s and 70s, taking pictures of these things on film as part of our, our hobby, these were hard to get. The, the modern age of, of uh, high sensitivity cameras is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. And this lagoon, it's one of the first objects I remember when I first started out observing what to, um, to look for because it, it pops. And it's such a particular magnitude. So it's, it's easy with the backyard telescope and binoculars somewhat to be able to find it. Um, but that, I, that would, I'm sure for many of the viewers out there, this is one of the first objects that they look for. It is, and it's a marvelous object. I can I can make it the full screen here, so you can see it better, and I can I can enlarge it. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of these these with the with the eye and a and even a small telescope. This is a, a wonderful thing, and if as one of the earlier speakers said, how easy it is to take pictures with an ordinary camera. Um, if you take a picture of the Milky Way, the right part of it in Sagittarius, this object will come up as a glowing pink spot quite nicely. Yeah, that's another thing, the good, the good thing to point out is that um, Sagittarius for our latitude here in Portland, it's fairly low above the southern horizon. So it makes it an additional challenge because we're looking through more atmosphere. So, um, but if you go further south, obviously it goes higher and higher, get better view. Um, but uh, that's one of the challenges, unfortunate challenges, just looking at Sagittarius as being so low uh, for our viewing, but it's still worth the shot, especially in the dark area. Uh, this is Don. I just want to interject for a minute. You know, this is a, this is a, a webinar about light pollution, and I just wanted to let people know that if you are under a dark sky, you can find the Lagoon Nebula with your naked eye. That's all I ever do. I use my naked eye. I point my telescope to it because I can find it with my naked eye. It's like a smudgy eraser mark and you can go right to it. So that just shows you how much you can see if you mm -hmm. remove the light pollution. Mm -hmm. And just to, to demonstrate that this is real time, um, I'm moving the telescope now. Um, this is not something stored. This is the real thing right now at this moment. What's the field of view you have set up on there? Um, it's about two moons high and three moons wide. And what, uh, what's, what's your, you got it at, uh, what aperture? This is an 11 inch telescope. 11 so inch, the, okay. The, the main lens is, um, 
uh, 11 inches across, and it's, it's specially designed to produce very, very bright um, views for imaging. Uh, this, this telescope, in fact, has no eyepiece on it at all. You can't look through it. You can only take pictures. Yeah, uh, right now, Sagittarius or for Lagoon, for that matter, is right almost directly due south or the transit right now. Is that right? Uh, yes. The, in fact, uh, just before you came on, the telescope decided, oh, it's moved across the meridian. I'm going to leave it and come around uh, and flip the telescope over. I saw that we had a question in the background. Um, someone raised their hand. Uh, to, are we well, taking? Are yeah, we we're going to take questions at the at the nine thirty. Okay, Richard. fine. Okay, so so uh, I'd like to suggest we move on to to Jupiter to catch up a little bit, and I think Keith should be ready. Yep, we go to Keith, and uh, Keith is going to show us uh, what Jupiter is looking like. Oh, it's looking great. Could you actually see the uh, great red spot at the edge here? Let me just share my screen. I just shop, stopped. Very good. So this is a live view of Jupiter wow. we've got going on here. Let me just get the... Uh, okay. So where are your, what's your location, Keith? I'm in Las Vegas here at the northwest part of town and uh, looking out over the roof of my house to the south here. And you could see I have a camera on my telescope. That, that telescope is uh, the large one, the eight inch SCT is giving you this live picture of Jupiter here, which I'm also recording so I can stack it later. I'm gonna zoom in the, the scene conditions. It gets blurrier if I zoom in, but you can see this red spot is right here. That is the great red spot. It's going to, rotate out of view uh, pretty soon, it's right at the edge. Uh, I'm actually gonna blow this up a little bit so that, uh, but I'm, I mean blow it out by uh, increasing, right now the exposure is 20 milliseconds. I'm gonna move that to 120 milliseconds. So we're gonna intentionally overexpose it so we can see the moons of Jupiter here, which is, uh, I believe that's Io, Europa and Ganymede. Let me just yep. confirm. Is yep. that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is. Uh -huh. And right now, Callisto, the fourth Galilean moon, is behind the shadow of Jupiter. And later on, we'll bring you that live as it comes out of the shadow and appears on the other side of Jupiter. Yeah, so we're at about 8.51 right now. Um, so, I mean, that should be oh, showing up. I and guess it's going to nice. show up, yeah. I guess we're running a little behind. So, yeah, I should just leave this overexposed right now and uh, I should actually I'm going to do another recording then. And so what's happening folks is that um, Callisto is moving into has moved into the uh, shadow of Jupiter in view from Earth right? and so it does this around every 16 days and so this is fun to show really that the um, so the motion, because it takes Jupiter only 10 hours to turn on its axis for a single day. So that means with the, with the moons of Jupiter, these are the four Galilean moons out of, there's a 82 moon total, but these are the four. And uh, Gal Sir Galileo uh, first observed these moons and he used it as a tool to demonstrate in science the, the orbital period of the moons around Jupiter. So you can see and right now we're coming up to 852, uh, Keith. And so um, we just start seeing barely um, Callisto start to um, reemerge. And that's what happens. And this is called like an eclipse, no oxidation, when you have one celestial body opening, uh, blocking another. And so um, this is a fun thing. This is, a, this is what it's all about, observing and getting the chance to see these kind of uh, things and there's a great diagram right there um, showing what's happening in the line of sight and uh, um, what we're seeing here is exactly that diagram that Keith is showing is that uh, from the from Earth's point of view okay, we're seeing that uh, Callisto moving into the uh, shadow and so it's coming out of the shadow, the umbra shadow and going into the pre number shadow, the outer edge, and it reemerged. And so uh, if, imagine if you were viewing 
Uh, if you're standing on Callisto and looking back at the Earth and Sun, it would be, you see an enormous Jupiter blocking the Sun, and then to the right, you would see the little pale blue dot is our Earth. Great job, uh, Keith. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Jim, if I can interject, this is David Blanchett. Sure. Uh, I was checking things here. Where Callisto will reappear, if on your, your computer screen, you take a couple of fingers and you measure from the left-hand side of Jupiter to a point midway between the first moon and the second moon to the left, then move that, move your fingers over to the right-hand side of Jupiter. That's about how far from the right-hand side of Jupiter Callisto should reappear. Okay, so let's try to stay on schedule if we can. Uh, if we go to 854, um, we should start barely seeing Callisto start to reemerge. Um, what's your field of view right now on this, Keith? I'm zoomed in here. I mean, if I could, I could zoom out. So yeah, it's it's pretty narrow field of view because the, the planetary camera is pretty zoomed in here. Uh, probably like ten minutes, ten arc minutes. Mm -hmm. Probably no, probably even smaller than that. Probably about no. It is arc going minutes. to be dim when it starts to reappear. You might want to up your exposure a little bit. Yeah, because because we're there now. To see if to see we're if we can catch it as it reappears. I'll uh, pump this up to a gain of 300. And, and Jim, while he's pulling this in, if you can get it on Stellarium, um, if, we, if we do miss it, we can just do a little quick, you know, two second video on the Stellarium. And okay. I am recording to 5,000 frames, so hopefully, oh, there it is, there it is. Let me zoom in. All right. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yes. Oh, one, two, three, four. It is. Well uh, yeah, that's fantastic. And generally, Callisto is the furthest moon away from Jupiter, generally. And Io is always the closest. Um, but um, those of you who are interested in finding out where the moons are related to Jupiter, there's a lot of resources. You can go to in.sky.org. In you can actually see the motion of Jupiter and find where they are. So, uh, how did we know who to? Well, we use these software to resource, right? So, wonderful job, um, Keith. Thank, Thank you, you for showing this to us. No problem. And I'm sure for many, this is the first time they've seen something like this. They actually see, they witness a, an eclipse um, from another world. And so, it's kind of mind blowing, right? Um, so, um, what I can, if you like, I can show you. Uh, my solarium, but I think we got a good idea. There we go. That's a great shot. Oh, oh okay. Okay. So um, let's go on to the next object. Um, Richard, uh, you got the Tripit uh, M20. And I'll stop sharing. Turn off my mic. Share the screen. Uh, um, stop sharing. Let's make sure I get that. Okay, um, we are running a little bit behind the schedule we set up, um, and um, the Trifid Nebula is here. This big thing here is a tree branch. <laughs> so, um, what I'm going to do, we'll, we should be able to, be, to see it with a longer exposure. Um, this is another star forming region. Um, <laughs> In the next few minutes, the star, because the telescope is following um, the object, the tree, <laughs> all I can say is, you know, trees, they're a problem. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, we have trees in Oregon, Richard. We, we have, I know, we have a, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, however, over here, okay, the object we intended to look at is right here. The tree looks like it's moving this way because the telescope is going that way and tracking the sky. However, there's another little star cluster over here. Yeah. Um, I don't know what this one's name is. Um, okay, and if it. I guessed it would be um, 
Does it look like an open cluster? Uh, oh. I hate it when things maximize and they shouldn't. Yeah. Um, however, yeah. we do have all lined up, or at least ready to go, um, a different type of cluster um, called a globular star cluster. And I want to get it before it goes into the tree, uh, which it will. Um, and I'm going to center it in the screen. Mark Ashley has uh, M22 on his uh, screen right now, Richard. Okay. So Mark, you want to show us uh, M22? Man, that's a nice cluster. Yes. This is a cluster of about 100,000 stars. Um, if Mark has it, I'm going to stop my share. Mark, do you have M22? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's M22. It's a globular cluster located in Sagittarius, everybody. Uh, it's a wonderful cluster. Uh, so uh, go ahead. Um, uh, can you share, Mark? Let me try it now. There we go. Okay. Okay, can you see? There we go. Okay. Yep. So this is, um, yeah, this is M22. It's a few hundred, probably three or 400,000 stars. I don't remember, remember the exact number, but uh, I'm going to, uh, I just, just caught this a few minutes ago, just before it went behind my house. And uh, so uh, zooming in here a little bit, you can see it's, it's just dense with, with stars going out to the edge of the field. Yeah. And, um, so it's a, these are all very, very old clusters, like on the order of 10 to 11 billion, billion years old. Um, globular clusters are pretty much as a rule, very old like that. So the stars are frequently um, quite old and white and yellow with age, essentially. Yeah, M22 is one of the first uh, clusters that were discovered. Uh, not the closest, but one of the first ones to be discovered and uh, used as a, a reference. Um, for determining the uh, location of the center of the Milky Way, which is orbiting around the center. And that thing is old. It's about uh, 12 billion years old. Yep. Okay. Right, so, um, Keith, are you ready? I'll release my I am. Here. I'm back here. Okay, so let's go to Saturn. All right, so first thing I'm doing is, let me just share my screen. I'm overexposing it again so we can hopefully see some of its moons. I'm gonna pump up my exposure here quite a bit. It really takes a lot to see those moons. And those of you um, viewing Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system. It's amazing. Everybody's favorite object to look at in a telescope. So there's some of the those dots around it are Saturn's moons. Can, I don't have the. I'm not going to pull up the diagram right now, but uh, Stellarium or Sky Safari can identify each of those for you. And now I'm going to lower the exposure to something reasonable, and we can actually view Saturn with its rings. I'm guessing about 40 milliseconds is going to be what we want to look at here. It looks like it's a little overexposed. Let me knock that down a little more. Oh, look at that. Can you can you uh, expand that to fill in the, the whole screen, Keith? Pretty much. Wow. Now, Saturn's in the constellation of Sagittarius to just to the left of Jupiter, about five, six degrees. It's not as bright as Jupiter. Uh, but it has the brightness, but uh, definitely worth a look. And uh, you can see the rings, uh, see the details. The bright object that was on earlier to the right was uh, Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. There's 82 moons, and that's the largest one. And Titan has an atmosphere. That is a great shot, Keith. Thank you much. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think this temperamental program, I'm going to have to quit it and restart it. I studied the region of interest, uh, gave it a little hiccup here. M17 is the Swan Nebula. Yeah. 
and I can quick throw on oh. the, the Triffit. Um, oops. Oh, I'm back with Saturn. Okay. Whenever you want to go. Okay, you want to share again, Kate? Sure. Gotta love technology, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I'm not gonna do anything fancy this time. Yes, uh, we got a question. Uh, are the rings moving? Absolutely, they are. Um, definitely moving. It's a faster than the speed of a speed of a bullet. And that's why they used to be uh, uniform. It's billions of ice chunks going around the equator. So we, uh, we're, there he is. It's giving me like a weird delay. There we go. All right. And put to highest speed. I'm going to try to zoom in on that. And so. binoculars, you could, um, could actually um, make out the ring, but it seemed like uh, it's like a blob. But if you get a six inch, eight inch, 10 inch telescope, uh, with uh, maybe 25 millimeter more or so, uh, you can actually get the ring. Oh, well, you actually got go. color in that, don't you? Keith? Yeah, this is a color camera. It's just a little temperamental, but there we go. It's finally behaving. And all that waviness, if she was referring to the ring movement, I think she might have been referring to the seeing conditions here which looking over my, all the concrete in this area, then we had 109 degree temperature here. So you've got all these thermals coming up from the concrete as Las Vegas cools off. And all of this waviness you see is turbulence in the atmosphere, if, if that's what you were referring to as far as ring movement. Um, Saturn now did pass meridian, that right? No, it's to the left of my meridian. Okay. So it hadn't reached its highest point yet. Yeah, yeah, it hasn't. Yeah. So, so maybe Jim, um, let folks know about how you, you know, sometimes you can see the rings better than others, depending on how much of Saturn is face on versus edge on. Yeah, and the, the Saturn ring, uh, of course, goes around the sun and the earth and so on with the other geometry. So it wavers back and forth between the north face and the south face. And then there are times to face edge on. And so a few years ago, the ring was facing edge on. We couldn't see the ring. This year and last few years, we've been in about 25 degrees. And so we can actually see the plane. So this is a, a great time to see the ring. And uh, those of you who wonder, next summer, uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be visible again about this time. But however, Jupiter is going to be on the other side of Saturn. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to see Saturn and Jupiter this summer, You'll have another chance next summer. I want to draw your attention to one thing before I go. You see this dark area right here? I just want to point out that is Saturn's shadow on the mm -hmm. ring. Mm -hmm. Great detail, Keith. Thank you very much. But you get long lines for that. <laughs> yeah, I usually do um, uh, camera-based uh, at, at our uh, outreach, so I get like uh, a crowd of people around me usually. <laughs> Yeah, in my star parties, once they see Saturn, that made their night. People go home oh, happy. Yeah. yeah, it's it's the okay. kind of object that hooks you for life in astronomy. Okay, okay so, so if we can, uh, if we can move on to, uh, Richard, you have M17 or you have something to show us? So, okay, this is M17. Um, it's called the Swan Nebula. Um, right now, we're looking at it upside down. Um, it also, you can imagine it looking like a duck. But this is another region like the Swan, I mean, like the uh, Lagoon and Triffid, where stars are forming inside this cloud of dust and gas. Um, this, this is parts of, a, of the star cluster that's forming, shining through. Um, this is areas where the gas and dust that are going to condense into stars are glowing under the light of stars. And although it's not very clear here, you can see there's dark areas here. These are part areas with dust and gas in them that are not lit up 
and they're blocking the light of the of the sky or the stars behind them. So we see them in silhouette. Um, this is a what's called a molecular cloud. Um, it's a place in the galaxy where gas is accumulating and making new stars. And we see that whole cycle of star formation uh, going on in these things. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. And then in order to keep on schedule, I'm simply going to have the telescope move. It's, it's now moving um, to the Eagle Nebula. And I will zoom in on that a little bit. Um, and I'm going to stop the long, the quick exposures and begin the longer exposures. Um, the Eagle Nebula is famous um, to non-astronomers because of the wonderful pictures that the Hubble Space Telescope took um, of this region in here. Um, it became called the Pillars of Creation. It's dense, dark material silhouetted against the background of, of um, newly formed and forming uh, gas. And again, you as you have with these dusty areas, we have another star cluster here. So this this area became famous. Um, I don't know if we have one we can we can pop up, but the Hubble showed this. In my view, it's small and fuzzy. In the Hubble's view, it's huge and complex and beautifully detailed. Um, sometimes people say, "Well, the pictures with your telescope are like the Hubble." They are nowhere near as good as the Hubble. Uh, Hubble is quite, quite amazing telescope in space. It's a beautiful shot. And that red is from the hydrogen. And uh, that's just a great shot, Richard. I got a, somebody been asking what kind of camera are you using? Uh, this is a camera um, made by a company in, in um, England called Attic, uh, A-T-I-K. Uh, and this is called a horizon telescope. Mm -hmm. It's a 22 megapixel camera. So it's basically very similar to a DSLR, but instead of being shaped like a regular camera, it's, it's housed in a, a <laughs> red cylinder um, mm -hmm. so that it can be attached to the camera or the telescope easily. Mm -hmm. Beautiful shot. And we are accumulating light. So as we watch, the image is getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And then it would look like the, it's a, a little bit of a cluster in that area. Yes. Um, there's, this is a very rich starry area here. Um, and just about yes, this is a cluster that's already formed. The way this, this tends to work is you have a lot of gas and dust accumulated one region of that gas and dust cloud condenses and forms stars. Mm -hmm. And then the wave of accumulating or formation moves on. So this is the old area where the stars were formed millions mm -hmm. of years ago. Now we've moved into this region where they're forming now. And some of these dark areas in here are dust and gas that are not lit up yet, but mm -hmm. will be in millions of years from now. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, again, this is all in the area of Sagittarius, what we've been looking at so far. And so there's like 14, 15 Messier objects alone in this area, in Jupiter and Saturn. All of this is contained just above the southern horizon. So we have roughly another month and a half to uh, be able to view all these objects. Okay. And kind of show you what we're going to be heading to next. Okay, and I need to. Okay, so here we are. If we, we were just at Sagittarius, okay, so we're now going to go up in the area of Perseus. And so to get to back to the northern part of the sky, uh, here, there's Cassiopeia, okay. 
And so I need to go a little bit further into the evening and move things around a little bit. Okay, and then there's just too many windows on here. There we go. And there's the first seats right there. And so uh, you cast your PA as a reference. Right? And so we're going to go dive into this area, the first seats right here, which is known as the hero. And uh, there's some wonderful objects in this vicinity that we're going to take a look at. Um, and if we go over towards this east, we have Andromeda, we have Pegasus, and uh, Cephas. Um, and we're going to look at some wonderful uh, deep sky objects in this area. So uh, if you're looking for Earth seeds, they're just above the eastern horizon. And so we're going to kind of swing in this area right here. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop sharing. And let's see, we got Andromeda from David. Uh, Andromeda's a little low. And so I can show you an image I took earlier here. And David, where's your location? I'm out in Amargosa Valley. Okay. The dark sky sh uh, spot that I found a few years back and marvelous 82 degrees out here and all the smoke is to the west. Uh, so it's actually not too bad. The stars are twinkling like crazy though, so the, the seeing isn't that good. Um, but what you should be able to see here is uh, in, uh, Andromeda Galaxy I took a little earlier. Um, that is a major shot. But uh, I don't have the facility to take multiple stacked images while I'm live. Um, but I have taken multiple pictures at places like Death Valley stack them together and, and bring out a lot of this detail. But it gives gives you an impression of things here. Um, I just like, want to uh, let yeah. folks know that the image on the invite, the image that you saw on the poster for the invitation and the agenda that's been posted around uh, Facebook is the Andromeda Galaxy. So that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, and Andromeda Galaxy is located about 2.9 million light years away. So what you're looking at back in time, and the photon that left the galaxy traveled nearly 6 trillion miles a year. And so um, when you look at it tonight, think about it, that you're looking at the Andromeda Galaxy as it was nearly 3 million years ago. You see the bright core, you see the center, um, it's in the evidence of black holes there, beautiful spiral. Um, I see that pointer that David has down there. It looks like you have a, a, a satellite or a meteor down there or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it looks like something. This was a 60-second uh, exposure, so all kinds of things can come fluttering by if you're not careful. Yeah, one of the things that been showing up is uh, Starlink uh, right lately. And, uh, you know, talking about dark skies, it's Starlink is becoming uh, one of the things that's coming up and in, in viewing uh, uh, for a long exposure. But what a great shot, David. It's pretty good for the seeing out here and, and such, yes. Mm -hmm. And Andromeda now is just, just above the eastern horizon, so it's not really high right now. So that, that, that poses a challenge at the Definitely. best time is to get it when it's nearly overhead and get a greater contrast. You can actually see the beautiful arms of the galaxy in the spiral. And this is used at the models. Um, I believe it's twice the size of the Milky Way, but it's a beautiful model of the bar spiral galaxy. And this is used as uh, kind of a guide to understanding uh, galaxies. There are millions of them. And that's a great shot, David. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, if we can actually, uh, Mark, um, you have the Bowtie Nebula. Here. Okay, so this is a, a target called uh, 
NGC um, 40, the Bowtie Nebula. So I'm going to slew over to it. And uh, so you can see our star is whizzing by here as it moves to uh, the nebula. And there it is right there. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and start stacking this. Can you see your bow tie in that? Yeah, it, it may be. It, it Maybe if you turn your head. So I'm going to go ahead and start live stacking. Yeah. And uh, it's a planetary nebula, isn't it? Yeah, it's a planetary nebula. And um, so here we go. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually letting the computer start collecting images and it's going to add images and the image will gradually get better and better. Uh, the seeing at my site is actually quite good. So um, we're, we got a good night going tonight. Um, and you can see down here, this is uh, a measure of the diameter of the stars in pixels as it stacks at the images. And each, wow. each new bar here is a new image getting added. Each image is only 1.5 seconds exposure. And so you can see over here, we're up to 15 seconds of exposure now. And with each, uh, with each image stack, the noise gets more, um, less and less and you see more detail in the nebula. Um, this is um, a lot of the nebula we were looking at in Sagittarius are actually star forming regions where stars are born. Um, actually, all of them that we were looking at were um, um, nebula where stars are being born, uh, star forming regions big clouds of hydrogen gas. This is um, actually the other end. This is a star that's in the process of dying. And the star that's dying is actually that little white star right at the center. Um, and it's produced what's called a planetary nebula, where it's just, it's starting to lose grip. It kind of bloats up as it gets old and it loses grip on its outer layers of gas. And it just kind of blows them out to space. And so over time, over, these types of nebula last um, a few a few thousand years, usually about 10,000 years or so before they dissipate. And so this is basically a bubble of gas that the, the star has blown. And we're looking at it from the side. We're looking through a bubble. And so this is kind of, you see these kind of weird kind of structures here on the sides. And those are kind of the, 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 the emission of the outer layers of the star when it when it blew off these outer layers, happened in several, kind of happened cyclically over, over a period of um, quite a number of years. And so you get these funny structures where you get layer upon layer of, of structure. And, and even if you imagine that this star had a planetary system, or even maybe it was a double star and had another star orbiting it, um, those sorts of of bodies orbiting the star that dies can actually produce weird kind of spirograph-like uh, patterns in the uh, in the shape of the planetary nebula that's formed. So yeah, yeah, this is actually going to be the future of our sun. Uh, it's going to be a yeah. red giant and become a planetary yeah. nebula, nebula nova, and then uh, so we're looking really at the fate of our sun billions of years from now. Yeah, the 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 color of the that you see here is. Is, uh, is red and uh, that actually means something to astronomers. When you see a lot of red like this, it means it's made of hydrogen. It's basically, you, you can kind of think of it like, uh, it's kind of like a neon tube in the sky, but instead of neon, it's hydrogen. Yeah. And this star is actually ionizing the hydrogen and making the hydrogen glow with its, its natural red color. So now we're up to about 90 seconds now. You can see the the image is a lot smoother now. We're seeing a lot more detail in the That's awesome. and so on. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, Richard, yeah. um, you have something to show us? I'll release mine. Yes, I do. Just a moment. Um, and then we'll go to you, Keith, after this. Uh, I have the moon and Mars rising here. Okay, so let's go to Richard, and then we'll get back to you, David. All okay. right. Here we go. Um, Ooh. what we have now, um, since I had, I, since I knew this object was on the list and was coming up, um, I slewed over to it and, um, this, we've, we've now been looking at things that are inside our galaxy. This is actually a picture of another galaxy. Um, the Andromeda galaxy, which we saw earlier is tilted. This one we're seeing face on and 
this is one in which um, another galaxy, it's two galaxies, another galaxy has disturbed this one by colliding with it and uh, distorting its, its form. Mm -hmm. um, if you think back maybe 100 million years, you can imagine this galaxy off somewhere further away and M51, as it's called, the Whirlpool Galaxy, being a nice, round, symmetrical object with two big spiral arms coming out. And then this guy comes zooming in, zooms past, and its gravitational field distorts our, our, our beautiful symmetrical galaxy. It throws parts of stars that are in this spiral arm way out into space. It throws more stars way off into space. This galaxy partially self-destructs. And we're looking at this beautiful symmetrical collision, <laughs> a car wreck, if you will, of two galaxies that are interacted. And this is how galaxies, when the, when the universe formed were many small galaxies, this is how galaxies have become large. They, they keep interacting with one another and building up. Yeah, and people, um, it's uh, just below the last star, the handle of the Big Dipper. Yes. And uh, what they, if you have a tail rad, you basically can hang the circle right at the end of the last star, the Big Dipper, and you can find uh, the Whirlpool. My personal favorite, it always has been, because it's, you look at this and go, wow, that's really, it's really there. It is, it's really the classic picture of a galaxy, this and the Andromeda galaxy. These are the ones that if you look in the textbooks and stuff, you find pictures of them. One of the wonderful things about amateur astronomy is that you see the pictures in the books, you read about these things, but in amateur astronomy, you can take the telescope and you can go out and you can see these things. They're really out there. They're real. Yeah, and people say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm looking at that. No, that's wonderful, Richard. Um, let's do it real quick uh, here. Uh, David, uh, can you uh, want to show us the moon here? Everybody, but you know, it's always amazing that when um, we talk about the moon, how many people have never seen the moon in a telescope? And they uh -huh. get mesmerized by it. So, um, can you unshare your screen, Richard? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, well, we're going to be able to have some Q&A after this so that um, Stop share. Okay. you'll be able to maybe ask any one of these guys a question. We'll, we can refer back to those images. So, David, if you can show us the moon, uh, which is a winning gibbous moon. Okay. Not, well, let's see. Okay. Um, I've played with the white balance. It's it's not it's showing purple on my screen. I don't know how it looks on your screen, um, but the the moon's up. It's very orange, and uh, Mars is right on top of it, coming up off the horizon. Oh, do you mean that? Uh, right on the upper left, upper left there. Yes, and to show you what my seeing is like at this altitude. This is the best image I can get of Mars right now. Is a nice It's definitely red, isn't it? <laughs> well, it could do that simply because it's so low and there's so much smoke in the air. But... Uh, yeah, well, it's, a half, it's half the size of the Earth and um, Mars is yeah. going to be more visible later this year in 2020. So... Um, it's just barely getting into the field of view for the evening. But yeah. uh, look at the details, the craters on the moon. And can you zoom in on that? Oh, let's see here. Um, you can see the heat shimmer. Yeah, yeah. You see the shadows, and then the shadow gives you some depth of what you're looking at on the surface of the moon. So that's why it's ideal to look at the moon before full 
and you can see the shadows. You get to really in depth uh, the mountains and craters that you know. Definitely think about too. They've been on there for millions and millions of years. So our ancestors are looking at the same object we are right now. It's an easy object to look at, and uh, yet it's difficult to explain to a layman why we go through phases of the moon and so on. Uh, and so um, that's a great shot, David. Considering the conditions, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind, kind of gruesome on the horizon out here. Yeah, so I think we can go one more. Um, Keith, can you have show us something? Sure. Let me uh, share my screen. So that's a picture of the wild duck cluster from my wide field telescope. And you can kind of see where the duck is or outlined from previously, uh, how it looks like a wild duck. This is also known as Messier 11. It's a uh, open star cluster. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at what, maybe a few hundred stars? Seems to be about a few hundred stars of all kinds, blue ones, yeah. yellow ones. Yeah, the bright ones. ones and what have you. That's the thing about clusters is that uh, when you first start out, people don't know what to really to expect or look for. And when you see an open cluster, is actually challenging because uh, it looks like a regular star field. And then they realize, oh, I'm looking at a group of stars here. About they're all related to each other. In some cases, they're the first generation of stars. Not always. Yep, yep. Yeah, the the nebula that Richard was showing earlier are the uh, are going to turn into um, uh, open star clusters after millions of years. Mm -hmm. and this one's about six thousand light years away. Okay, so um, well, duck cluster, what constellation again, Keith? Oh, good question. I think it's in Sagittarius. It's in Scutum. Scutum? Oh, thank you. Yeah. I can always, always I guess forget just words. above it. Yeah, as I recall, this is also called the salt and pepper cluster. Get the why. Is it really? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, with fun and a lot of imagination and people come up with these crazy names. So true. Yeah, it's just uh, above Sagittarius. So we, little cluster. Okay. I just want to remind folks that uh, for folks that need to leave at 930, um, you know, by all means, but we are going to be live until 10 p.m. And if you have questions, now's the time to get your questions in on the Q&A box if you're on the Zoom meeting and to get them in on the comments on, on the Facebook Live. And uh, we'll give you about another minute or so to do that. Um, and we can go to Q&A for just a few minutes while other folks are, are rendering other objects. And then we'll come back and wrap up at 10 o'clock with some more objects for you all. Actually, I want to recognize all these guys, uh, Richard and um, Richard and, and uh, Keith and David and Mark for a great job um, of providing us this wonderful view. And I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people excited um, to be able to um, observe and see the importance of dark sky and they're able to see these wonderful objects uh, from a lot of various locations. So. Thank you all for sharing your telescope, your time, your expertise on the viewing of the nighttime sky. Um, so um, at this point, like Don said, uh, we kind of open up to Q&A and um, we've got uh, a few already. Ashley, you got some uh, questions for us? Yeah, um, one of the first questions we got was uh, the why did the moon appear pink, David, when you showed it on the screen? Oh, David, you're on mute. Yep. I, can, oh, I okay. think that's mainly the color balance either in the, the uh, well, the white balance either in the camera or in my software. Um, I, I've set it for, I, I've set the, the uh, program to use a daylight white balance. Um, 
but I, I'm, I'm not completely sure why it was more purple than an actual orange. That's something I need to look into. David, while I have you you um, on uh, available to talk, not on mute, um, everyone was kind of interested in the different telescopes people were using and the different mm -hmm. software. So David, if you could go first and then we can go around. I'm using a, an eight inch Newtonian astrograph of uh, F, uh, F number 3.9. So it's a wide field. It's very much like uh, Richard's field, like he was saying, three moons wide, two moons high. Uh, so it's a, a degree by one and a half degrees. Uh, the camera I'm using is a DSLR Canon TI-7. And the software, software is called Backyard EOS, uh, which is uh, a package that uh, there, there's a software kit that you can get for uh, a software library you can get for the Canon cameras. And about the time I was thinking about writing the software to talk to the camera, I discovered this program and it's done pretty well. Um, but there's a couple of other things I want to look at and see if I can use them. And can you remind everyone where you are tonight, David? I'm out, I'm out in Amargosa Valley, a little south of Highway 95 uh, along the uh, Death Valley Junction Highway. That's great. Mark, can you share some of that same information about your telescope software and location? Uh, yeah, I'm in uh, Vancouver, uh, Washington, just across the river from uh, um, Portland, Oregon, um, and the Columbia River, that is. Um, and uh, um, I'm, um, my uh, telescope is set up in my backyard. It's a, it's a 16 inch uh, Dobsonian tracking telescope. And uh, I have a ZWO uh, uh, camera attached to it. Um, and um, it's a focal length about 1900 uh, millimeters, something like that. I think that was that, was that the full list of questions? Yeah, on the, you did it. <laughs> okay, I think I've, I've got a picture of it somewhere or other. So um, okay. actually, I think I sent one to Dawn and I, I've got it up um, if, if somebody wants to see it. Okay. All right, good. Yeah. Uh, Keith, do you want to share your? Yeah, there's. Sure. So I got a live camera shot on mine. Uh, I got two telescopes here. One's hiding behind the other. Uh, the main scope is an eight inch uh, Celestron Edge HD Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which is what I've been using for planetary tonight. Uh, that's got the planetary camera. And then the, uh, which is a ZWO ASI 178 MC. MC is the color version. Um, and then the wide field telescope is an 80 millimeter APO refractor from Explorer Scientific and it's got a um, Canon 70D on it with a light pollution filter. Oh, you know, I forgot to mention my, uh, my software SharpCap is what I'm using for live stacking. Oh, and I'm using a Mac, so I am using Astro DSLR and uh, for the Canon, and I'm using a program called Planetary Imager for the ZWO planetary camera. And then I'm also using Sky Safari to control the telescope as a planetarium program. Yeah, that's the same one I use. Cool. Richard, I think you're the last one. Let us know what you're using tonight. Nice. <laughs> huh. <laughs> There's that tree. I know. <laughs> Trees in Oregon. <laughs> Trees in Oregon. Yeah, you're gonna have a line I, of people. Have... You're gonna have a line Three. of people showing up at your house tonight, Richard. <laughs> oh, Richard's still on mute. I'm gonna ask him to unmute. Unmute. Sorry. Um, no problem. Yeah, I, I, I took this, uh, I wrote an article for a magazine recently and they said, we need a picture of your telescope. And I did what astronomers never do. I turned on lights in the observatory and I posed a picture. So I'm sitting at a little console with a, a laptop computer in it. The telescope is, is here. You, that's the telescope proper. The mounting which points it is here. And you can see there's a tangle of spaghetti uh, wires coming off the telescope. Um, 
So that's the that's the instrument. Um, it's a it's what's called a Row Ackerman telescope, 11 inches aperture, 24 inches focal length. So it's f 2.2. It's faster than a lot of regular uh, prime camera lenses. Hey Richard, if you could uh, check your phone for a text message uh, I just sent you for some in, uh, objects later. Uh, okay, well, I'm just trying to figure out how to. Here we go. Get back out of that. I think throughout the whole entire um, uh, webinar meeting today that uh, we answered a lot of the questions in the chat. If anybody has any more, um, we will continue to try to answer those questions. But in the next uh, 15 minutes that we have to go live, we can continue to look at objects Does that, that work for everyone. Uh, and does there, anybody? Oh, there are questions in the uh, Q A and A box too. Have we we captured those? Not just uh, the chat, but the Q A box. Yeah, okay. a, a lot of okay, questions about the programs and the cameras that they use tonight. Okay. Okay. And uh, I, I think I'm seeing all the ones I'm seeing have been answered. If you're Great. seeing other ones, Don, though, let me know. Might be different between screens. Yeah, I've actually got a text message uh, not on chat. I don't know why somebody texted me, but anyway, <laughs> uh, somebody asked if we can uh, possibly see M13 of Hercules, if anybody can swing to that one, um, because that's a really easy object uh, to I, look at. I did take pictures of it earlier when I was setting up. Is, was that M30? You mean M33? I, I see M33. You say M13? M13? M13 is in Hercules, everybody, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's an easy object, great one to start off with binoculars, and it's on the right-hand side of the Keystone. Hmm. Nice shot, Mark. Oh, Dick David? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Start counting stars. Yeah, I think M13 is behind my house. The, the dancing man, I always call it, because it looks like, you know, lots of arms in the dancer. <laughs> yeah. The cat I show in the planet kind of it's called that uh, on the bowl of diamonds. And they're looking at uh, roughly 300,000 stars. It's amazing. And then uh, it's bright, it's bright core, really easy. Um, so far we've cataloged 151 of these. Uh, object and they're always around the center of the Milky Way. But what a shot! Nice shot! Nice contrast! Yeah, it turned out pretty well, but it's also very high in the sky. So, yeah, so Hercules is overhead. So, this is an ideal time actually to look yes. at it because it's less and more transparent overhead. And uh, if, you, if you are like David, then you have the moon, it's red to look at more atmosphere, but it's overhead, it should appear to be more white. Oh, she said, uh, thank you. She said, my tech manager said, thank you for the picture. <laughs> okay, I, I sent you a, a text as, as well, Jim, with some uh, highlight objects. In the meantime, we got a question about the best um, places to view the night sky in Southeast Oregon. Um, Dawn, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when we say Southeast Oregon, we're talking about the three states and there's really no bad place in all of those three counties. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, those counties, each of those three counties is about the size of Rhode Island. And the entire population, uh, if you don't count Mal uh, Malheur County just outside of Boise, is maybe about 14,000 people. So we're talking super remote. Even if you go into the towns themselves in Lake County, you are still under about a class two uh, sky instead of the most pristine at class one. And the best that you can get within Oregon in about an hour's drive is a class four in about two hours drive, you can get to kind of two-ish three, and you need to drive 
three hours from Portland, Oregon to get to um, a class two to one sky. So all of Southeast Oregon is just absolutely fantastic. That's why we're working so hard to get it on uh, as an international dark sky place. And most of that land is, is federal land. It's, it's the uh, Bureau of Land Management or it's the National Park Service. So it's public land. There's plenty of places to do um, primitive camping. And there's some RV parks as well that you can stay in that um, uh, Juniper, I think it's Juniper Ridge, it's a Juniper RV campground. Okay, we got a request for M33 from Jim Riley. Anybody can shoot for M33? And M33, what is that? Uh, Jim, I could swing over to M33, but before I do that, I have a very nice picture of the Veil Nebula. Oh, um, perfect. Which is another type of object mm -hmm. that, that if you're looking at for object types to talk about, this is, this is what's called the supernova remnant. These, when a massive star, um, we, we talked about the planetary nebula, but when a massive star ages, instead of blowing off shells, nicely, it blows itself completely to pieces. Uh, and this is part of a ring of gas um, blown off from that star. So you can see it, it will just keep going around and around and around. It's big in the sky. It's about three or four moon diameters across. Um, and this is just one segment of it. Um, and once again, here's this red, we meet our, our familiar friend hydrogen gas. And the blue tends to be from, in this case, oxygen uh, that's highly ionized and very hot. Um, so I just so Richard, wanted to show you that. I will. Yeah, Richard, can you show um, roughly tell us where it is and the relationship to Cygnus the Swan and and the filter that he's used to see this? Uh, there's no filter. This is a natural color image. It's okay. If 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 your eyes were really sensitive to dim light or color in dim light, which they're not. This is the colors you'd see um, in reality. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing while I um, reconfigure this the telescope and slew over to M33. Hey, Jim, um, I've got uh, M27 up. I can show that uh, for while he's doing that and then move over to my next target. Okay. Okay. By the way, I've tried to shoot M33, but it's over there with the moonlight and the smoke, and it's just blowing out the entire image. Uh, even that's, what I was, that's exactly what I thought would happen. Yeah. M33 so this, is beautiful, but it's, it's a large but rather dim galaxy. So uh, this is M27. Um, and uh, it's in Volpecula, just uh, um, um, below um, the Summer Triangle. Um, and uh, um, it's another planetary nebula, a dying star. And, and you can see the dying star is like that little dot right here. Uh, this is about, we're about seven minutes into imaging here. So you can see the, um, you can see the, uh, the level of detail that, uh, that you can get as you um, collect more and more image data. And uh, that uh, little star in the middle, that's the star that, that produced this entire nebula um, that's um, on the order of a few dozen light years across. Uh, let's see, M27, hang on. How big is M27? Uh, it is, uh, da -da. Right. Yep. it's about 3.2 light years across, um, but it's fairly close to us at only uh, 1,400 light years. So it looks actually fairly large. It's actually a pretty big nebula. But yeah, uh, you can, I'm sorry? Yeah, you can, uh, some people call it an alpha core. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really does look like an alpha core. Yeah, visually when you see it in a small telescope, you pretty much only see this blue region here, which looks kind of like a dumbbell. And the red doesn't really show up very well. So or actually, no, no strike that you actually see this region here. And these outer regions you don't see as much, but 
again, you can see the funny structures that uh, I imagine there were some planets or a, uh, another star that orbiting this that produced these weird kind of bipolar structures as, as the nebula formed. You can go back to that map briefly um, that you just had oh. up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so here's here's where I'm pointing right now. And yeah, so if you were there, uh, for folks who are looking for this, uh, you can make an imaginary spot with the constellation of Cygnus the Swan and draw an imaginary rectangle. Right. It's right in that location uh, for uh, yeah. outlining El Barrio right below that. But if you would put that mm -hmm. in, in imagination uh, at the rectangle with the four other stars of Cygnus, uh, that's an easy spot uh, for viewing the dumbbell or the alpha core. Mm -hmm. And the Veil Nebula is this object we were looking at just yeah, a few perfect. moments ago, yeah. just under the, the, the wing of, uh, or actually it's above the wing because Cygnus is actually flying downward rather than upward, but um, that's, yeah. <laughs> Richard, did uh, that uh, Veil Nebula, the stars plotted about, what, 60,000 years ago or something like that? I may, I may be wrong, but that's I, the number that I comes to my head. I can't remember the age that's been determined for it. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey um, Richard. The veil, um, oh, sorry, the Veil is about 8,000 years ago that that supernova went off. Yeah, I was going to ask, since uh, Richard has a very... Uh, you know, landscape mode. If we could okay. go to the double cluster in Perseus, because this is something that you can go out again, even in a not so dark sky. So even if you roam within 30 minutes from a city, you can often see the, the double cluster with your naked eye between Cassiopeia, the big W, and Perseus, the string of pearls below it. And right in the middle there, you'll see what looks like two like erasure marks, like little smudgies. And if you just have a pair of binoculars, you will see these two beautiful open clusters. And so I was hoping we could get those in with a, a scope. I will get that for you in just a okay. moment. Um, since... That's definitely a naked eye object and a binocular object if you don't and, have dark skies. That's a fun fact on that too, is it's not one of the messy egg object in the catalog that he overlooked it. He didn't think of anything of it. And so people get that all the time. Why is it a Messier object? Well, I think he just kind of overlooked it. Well, I, I would, I would uh, submit that since he was looking for comets and then just erasing yeah. everything that didn't look like a comet, it's such a big naked eye object that it probably was clearly not a comet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so he didn't yeah. have to eliminate it. That explanation works for anything but the Pleiades. <laughs> Okay, this is not the double cluster. Um, this is one of the objects that Dawn and I looked at. Mm -hmm. um, this is an object that amateur astronomers seldom look at in their telescopes, mostly because they didn't know it's there, because it's not that hard to see. It's called the Crescent Nebula. And we, we saw um, the supernova remnant, the Veil Nebula, which was a shell of gas from a star that blew up. This is a star that has not blown up yet. It's the one that I'm circling. If my, if my um, cursor is visible, it's that guy. And he has very, very super hot star that is blowing off its outer atmosphere all the pieces. Um, it's a super hot, super bright star. Um, and so you have this shell, it's actually a bubble um, of, of gas blown off by that. So I will um, quick like, I just wanted to show you that because it's, it's a neat object. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, nobody knew about sort of. Uh, the telescope is moving now. Um, we're on our way. Oh. For the person who wanted to see M33. Um, um, yeah, that was Jim Riley. Yeah, my apologies. It's below a tree. We can't get it. Here we go. The telescope is moving. It's taken off. Stars are zipping by. 
I think we can all agree to this that uh, digital technology has really opened the door to these wonderful viewing. I remember a few years ago, film was everything, but you never knew what you were going to get out of it. But digital technology really had opened the door for all these exciting opportunities to see these kind of things in a shorter amount of time, but instantaneous almost. Yes. Um... And here we are, this is the double cluster. Um, easy to spot in binoculars. It's right midway between Cassiopeia and Perseus. And you see these two little sparkling gems of, of star clusters. Um, that my, my... It's one of those things too, that when you see the double cluster and you see Capella, you know winter is coming because it's emerging from the east. And so uh, farmers, early farmers would see that. They, you know, they see the Pleiades, they see the double cluster, and they see Capella. Uh, oh, okay, well, you know, this winter is just around the corner. So I have a special request of Keith or, or Richard. I have a cousin in Maryland who's been staying up with us all night and she's asked if we can take one more look at Saturn. I can try to accommodate that. Yes, uh, Saturn is not actually behind my trees, but my telescope is designed for wide angle views. Um, so, someone asked uh, me, Richard, are you inside the observatory? I'm in my office. Okay. <laughs> I, what I'm showing you is I'm sharing the screen of the computer that's in the observatory. Okay. I just wanted to clear that up for somebody because said, I'm why slow Richard, to it. Yeah, Richard uh, got your light turned on while you're in the observatory. That doesn't work. <laughs> when, when, when I'm observing, there's absolutely no light at all in the observatory. The computer is completely covered and blacked out. There are no lights. Um, that, that picture was a fake because they wanted to be able to see me and the telescope. Trying to get it, It'd take a few minutes to get a new view. By the way, something I wanted to mention before about M33, the reason it's uh, so dim is because it's in the plane of our Milky Way galaxy. And so there's a lot of gas and dust that uh, dims the light that comes from it. Okay. And I just want to, while, while that's being pulled up, just let everybody know that uh, we have photographs from all the images that we've showed tonight. And we're going to be posting them and we'll probably put them on each of the websites of the uh, astronomy clubs that have been involved tonight and also on the Basin Range Dark Sky Cooperative's website and on Facebook. So if you want to find these pictures, um, that's where to look. Another thing too that I want to just make a quick announcement. Many people know me already that we are, uh, we have the planetarium at OMSI. We do a night type, night guy talk every month uh, in Star Night Live. And it's just another way you can learn about where these objects are, what constellation is being viewed, and um, and we show pictures and so on. So that's another avenue you can look at is to come visit the planetarium at OMSI. And that also, of course, um, encourage you to come to join the Rose City Astronomers Club, which meets every third Monday of the month, virtually at this point. Um, we don't know when we're going to be going back, but uh, that's another resource. And then uh, uh, 45 in Salem, another wonderful group uh, down there. There's the Southern Oregon um, Astronomy Group, and there's Sun, uh, Sun River Observatory, uh, just to name a few. And uh, Don is very much in, involved with the uh, I think big role at Road City Astronomers with uh, Dark Sky. Um, but she's also on uh, a board member uh, for Rose City. So um, lots of resources. Uh, you can always uh, send email questions uh, about any of the things that were happening tonight. Uh, but we hope to see you, everybody in person, back in person, safe and healthy at OMSI sometime in the near future. 
Don't know when, but soon. Okay, how are you going? How are you? Uh, what's the status on on uh, Saturn, Keith? It, okay, let's try this again. Zoom crashed on me. Okay, share screen. And then I wanted to ask where you see the um, uh, more density and then you kind of see it, uh, you know, less dense on the outer side. Is that a demarcation that we're seeing as best as we can see it through your scope of the Cassini division? I'm sorry, ask that again, please. So I can't clearly see like the black line of the Cassini division, but what I can see- Oh, it's see, overexposed right now. <laughs> yeah, in your image is if you really look, if folks really look at it, you can see a place where it looks denser. It just looks, uh, the inner ring is denser and then the outer ring just looks a little lighter in color. Um, and I think that's the demarcation too, that if it were at a higher magnification, you'd be seeing this, this thing called the Cassini division that is actually mm -hmm. kind of like a, an inner band. If so, if you re, if folks really look at it, you will start to Let's see if I can get a, clean this up a little bit. My scene is not fantastic. Yeah, the atmosphere is quite turbulent. Yeah, yeah, it's because I'm in, surrounded by all this concrete. If I could go out to a nice area and do it and have internet, then, and of course the camera has got it on its side. Let's see if I can rotate that yeah. a little. So if folks can get binoculars on a tripod, even a 10 by 50 pair of binoculars that you can take anywhere, um, get them on a tripod, there's a lot that you can see. But when it comes to the planets, if they're low on the horizon, if there's a lot of atmosphere, sometimes we call them boiling. You just cannot get them clear. And then sometimes you can count the bands on Jupiter. So it, it really is dependent on conditions. It, you you could see it in the Cassini division just for moments. Yeah. You know, just for, I mean, when you looked at it, it's like it would, it would show up in one frame and then be gone the next. And that, that's, yeah. that's common when the seeing isn't so mm -hmm. great. I'm not going to try to turn the camera. It's like vibrating it too much. Um, let's see. I'm going to go get up us to... back into refocusing. Okay. And so once we get this uh, cleared, we're going to be signing off and Camera's saying um, until the next time, the best time to go out and see stars under a dark sky is look for when the oh. moon is not out. When the I see what's out, happening. You should be out. Saturn's going behind my chimney. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, why is it dying out? Well, I'm that's, sorry. It's, it was all all orchestrated to for that to happen for our, for our ending. So, Lisa, I hope you got your uh, Saturn fix for the evening, and I hope everybody who stayed with us. So, we had up to I think it was about 109 people. We had 363 people registered. Uh, over 100 people attending, which isn't bad considering it's a, a um, Labor Day weekend. So thanks all for coming. This will be available on the um, YouTube channel for the Basin and Range Dark Sky Cooperative. So you can um, find it there and share it with friends. And hopefully we'll be doing this um, the next time the weather permits. So that's from um, earlier. Yeah, so if everybody just, uh, the whole team gets back on here with a good wave goodbye, all right? Let me change my camera. Okay. <laughs> I've got the telescope. All right. So all right. dark skies, everyone. Turn out your lights when you don't need to use them. Click. Dim them down <laughs> to not be so bright. Put them on a nice warm setting. And you're going to help save our stars. And put good shielding on your light so they good only shielding. shine down. Shine down. Mm. Don't, shine down. Don't shine them up, shine them down. And for more information, go to the International Dark Sky Association site at darksky.org. We also have a chapter, an Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association, and you can learn more there on their website. All right. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Good, good night, night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night.